best driver's car 2020. Now this is a feature that Autocar has been running annually for the last 31 years and it's been a little bit more complicated to arrange than usual what with this and that but the premise remains the same. We take the greatest sports cars launched this year, we take a bunch of expert judges and me and we decide which is the most fun car to drive. Right I'm going to let you into a small secret if I may. This test was going to happen in Wales but at the moment in Wales you can't even buy a duvet so we relocated, very short notice, to Castle Coombe, which is cool, because this is a circuit I like very much. However, it does mean we're rather limited on time, but no worries, because we've got a great circuit, a great set of cars, and we are just gonna crack on. And I'm gonna start in the BMW M2 CS. So the M2 CS is a front engine rear wheel drive, six cylinder turbocharged bruiser of a car mega engine really strong it steers really nicely body control is absolutely outstanding and it has got that kind of balance that you hope and expect for from a front engine rear wheel drive BMW M car now we had a go in it on the road yesterday and it has got a really good chassis a really good chassis it's it's quite firm but the whole shell feels really rigid and it's just very faithful and predictable and seriously good fun. And it moves around, it slides around a bit, but the back is exactly where you want it to be. It's really pointy. I have an awful lot of time for this car. I think it is absolutely superb. It's a lot of money. And whether it is worth the extra over a standard M2 competition, I don't know. But if you want something really special from your M2, this is the place to come. And so to the Toyota GR Yaris, which should be great in the wet. It's a real hero on the road. Proper, real proper little car. Feels so agile, so darty. So if we put it in sport mode, I think that gives more power to the rear out of all the modes that you can put it in. It's a little four wheel drive, hot hatchback with a three cylinder, 260-ish horsepower engine. There is isn't a reasonable amount of lean, but it has got loads of grip and it's fast. A real snickety manual gearbox. Boy, you can carry so much more speed than you could in that BMW, which was wearing Michelin Cup 2 tyres. This has got loads of grip, loads of poise. Wow. <laughs> So on the road, the steering felt ever so slightly, numb is the wrong word, but it's not loaded with feel. However, once you start getting more lean and more force into the chassis and onto the tyres, that transmits back through to the steering rim and there's loads more feel. My goodness, this is so good and so fast. This is wicked. Right, there is stability off down there. So let's see how it behaves. You've got to pick your corner at Castle Coombe, I think, to start messing around with a car in the wet because this is a circuit that is very, very fast. So maybe just through the chicane, we'll just mess around with it a bit. It's just really well behaved. It's really, really thoroughly well sorted. I can see this car doing really well. It might be a different story if it were totally dry, I suppose, but I can see this car impressing a lot of people. What a cool car. Okay, this is the Ferrari F8 Tributo, a car whose engine they liked so much, they named the whole car after it. With sport mode at the moment, the little Manatino can be put through to various stages from wet all the way through to everything off. Actually, on the morning I speak to you, somebody tried the everything off in an 812 on a London bridge and managed to bin their car very, very quickly. So, you know, we'll be a bit circumspect. But my experience with the mid-engine V8 Ferrari is that typically, once you can get heat into their tyres, they are very, very docile. In these conditions, it's slightly hard to get heat into the tyres, so uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. What I love about mid-engine Ferraris, they are, for a really powerful car, 
so approachable and just not intimidating in the slightest, which is amazing really given the amount of power they've got, where the engine is, you know, all of their mechanical layout suggests that they should be angry mid-engine, really fast, difficult to drive monsters in the way that an old mid-engine supercar would once have been. Absolutely none of that. They're just really friendly all the time. Just want you to have a lot of fun. But at the same time, also fearsomely fast and make a brilliant, for a turbocharged car, make a brilliant noise. Great gearbox, really good brakes. It's slightly snappy in these conditions, but nothing really frightening or intimidating. I absolutely adore the way mid-engine Ferraris behave. Now you may just hear in the background a slight tremor in the Ferrari's engine note. It was a misfire to the extent that we had to retire it from the contest and later diagnosed with a cracked spark plug. My guess it would have been top four easily or perhaps even better in this contest. Various recent versions of the mid-engine Ferrari have even won the contest outright. And so to the silence of the Porsche Taycan, which I think is the first I've been doing 15 of these and I don't remember having an EV at this event before. I suppose we could have brought the Tesla Roadster when that was a thing, but I don't think we did. So this is the first EV driver's car, I suppose. So let's see how it gets on. Well, I was gonna say this car doesn't feel its weight on the road, but actually when you try and stop all of this weight on a circuit, it does want some stopping. I think, the f I think it is there, but then unlike most internally combusted cars, I suppose when you ease off, the deceleration isn't naturally there. You don't get the engine braking straight away. So you've got to kind of do it all, even though I've got the regen turned up onto its higher setting. No gears to worry about, of course. And it's got loads of grip, loads and loads of grip. And it does not feel quite fast. It doesn't feel its weight until you start trying to slow it and then the brakes are actually a little bit grabby. On the road, you don't notice, but because you put so much more effort into them on a circuit, I guess it's usually doing regen on the road and very rarely using the discs, whereas on circuit, it's going through that regen phase really quickly and into the brake disc zone much quicker. So it just has a thing, as you lift off and start to brake, it just has a thing doesn't like breaking through that standing water, but that's no surprise. Just as you lift off and start to brake, it just has a thing of hesitancy where it goes, oh, and then, yes, I'll give you lots of anchorage. We'll quite often invite big, heavy cars to this contest, and they don't always do very well, but we thought, well, we'll see how the Porsche gets on. What I like is the fact that in corners, it generates loads of grip and feels more agile than it should but to the same extent, there's no getting over the ultimate physics, but blimey, it's really, really capable. And then when you put your foot down, that's 80, and then that's 90, and that's 100, It really, and that was 110. It really shifts in a straight line. Love this car, I'm impressed by this car. Really enjoy it on the road, really feels like a Porsche in character. Not surprising, it's not brilliant on track, it's not a track car. What it is, is a really interesting, really good driver's car that feels like a Porsche does. We're probably putting it outside its natural comfort zone. Okay, so to the Aston Martin V8 Vantage, or just Vantage, I think, isn't it? Vantage Roadster. And what a noise that engine makes. We go roof down, because hey, why not? It's not raining at the moment. That engine makes a cracking noise. I hope you can hear me with the wind, but that it's not too bad. That is the four litre AMG V8. And we just fancied another front engine, rear drive car in the mix that can do that sort of thing. Oh, great crackle on the overrun. I don't think you fully hear that with the hood up. So Aston calls this car, it's, it's Hunter, if you like. It says it is its most extreme, angriest sports car. That will be until the mid-engine ones arrive, I guess. But it's still fairly GT-ish. I'll tell you what you can feel is the wobble that this chassis has when you take the roof off of it. 
it is not the stiffest shell in the world. It wants to move around a bit, that's okay, I'm happy to let it. It's all about the noise and the grunt and the anger. Right, let's see if I can get the ESC off entirely. Now it's off completely, pick your moments, and let's see what kind of balance this car has. It's finding reasonable grip in the wet, to be fair to it, and I do like the fact that if you just sort of trail the nose into a corner, it turns in quite well, and then when you get back on the power, it straightens its line. See what else it'll do if you go wild. Yeah, just will indulge in nice, big, lazy drifts, because you know what, engines at the front, rear wheels are driven. It's a four litre V8 with turbos and a limited slip differential. And the one thing Aston does do quite well is chassis balance. So although the inherent problems with this car, you take the roof off, you make it more floppy, you put all the extra weight at the back, and it's only an aluminium structure in the first place, so not always, and it doesn't always feel the stiffest structure. It's quite an endearing, quite an appealing car. I don't think it's gonna win, but I think a lot of people are gonna come away having said, you know what, yeah, I rather enjoyed that. It's a real sort of Sunday morning trip out for a cup of coffee sort of car, I think. All right, so welcome to the inside of a 911 Porsche Turbo S. You know what that means? Really fast. Right, how fast? Oh, mighty fast. So fast, the sound feels, the sound seems almost augmented. I don't know if it is. Boom. Lots of cornering grip given the conditions, which are improving. Oh, it's really capable, no denying that. But high speed corner here, you come through at like 70 and there's a little lean. Quite good steering feel, but it just eats up the next straight. The brakes are phenomenal. It's incredibly sure footed. Whoa, it just stops brilliantly. It steers nicely. I don't get loads back, but it's very smooth. The chassis is unbelievably capable, really, really well sorted. Oh, and it gets on at a hell of a speed. But that is the thing about 911 and 911 turbos of late, I think. They are quite often not the favoured driver's cars among 911s. Because they're so capable. Aloof is the wrong word, because the steering does give you lots back. It does tell you what's going on so brilliantly, brilliantly able. But they don't grab you in the way that a GT3 does and put all the engineering right in front of you to feel. There's less adjustability than there is in some other 911s. I mean, this is seriously good, seriously capable. And if you said to me now, right, you've got one of these cars and you've got to drive it to Germany. And by the way, it's November tomorrow. I think I'll probably say, yeah, I'll have the 911, please. Thanks very much. But that isn't strictly the idea behind this contest. The idea is somebody says, right, it's Sunday morning. There's a decent road. You may end up at a decent track. What car are you going to take? I don't think it would be this. Brilliant, though, I can see that it is. Doesn't leave me cold. That's the wrong phrase. Cold is the wrong phrase. Just doesn't leave me warm. Does that make sense? This car is going to be brought to, to you by the numbers 765 and the letters L and T. I'll tell you what, one thing about McLarens, you can always find a sensational driving position. So it's a drying track, so let's put the powertrain into track. Handling I will leave on sort of sport at the moment, see how dry it is. So one of these fearsome McLarens. It does rather feel like you were at the pointy end of something in this car, in a way that the Ferrari doesn't feel that intimidating from the off. This does. Pedals are brilliantly set up, so if you want a left foot brake, you can. Okay, quite explosive from the off. So a colleague just went out and said, whoa, it wasn't as fearsome as I was told. I don't know, on that showing, OK, it feels like a McLaren. It makes the same noise. It has brilliant, brilliant steering, absolutely flat body control as you turn in. So there is grip there, and the front end is pointy.
really feel it struggling to gain traction as the circuit dries out a bit. Some grey clouds overhead still. Has a very McLaren y feel to it. I mean, these cars get better and better and better, but fundamentally, the McLaren feel is still the same. You turn, they turn. They have really crisp turning, but sometimes they start to push on a little bit into understeer, and then when they do let go into oversteer, there's no limited slip differential, so it's kind of done on brake steer and then power. So when they do let go, crikey, they can sometimes let go very, very quickly. So what do I like about them? I love the steering, I love the body control, I love the ride on the road, and it is exciting, and there's no question that this is among the most exciting of all. But, and there is a slight but, it doesn't have the same joyousness for me in the chassis that the Ferrari does, and it doesn't just communicative though the steering is, I'm just waiting really for the moment when the turbos really wind up and they kick the tail sideways, and I don't entirely know when that's going to happen. And what it does, it can happen quite quickly. This is a wee bit less spiky actually, now that there's a little bit of heat into the tyres than I thought it might be. Right then, to an aerial Atom 4. This is here because it's the reigning champion. It won this contest last year. There is a load of standing water. I just turned down a pair of waterproof trousers. That might be my biggest mistake of the day. As was bringing a helmet with no visor. But Atoms are brilliant because they're so immediate and so direct. You know, a proper lightweight small sports car. They steer brilliantly. Oh, God, I don't want too many right-handers. Oh, wow, that is terrific. Even in the wet, you can rely on it, you can lean on it a bit. Oh, that is cool. It's just such a... Everything talks to you, you're involved in it all the way. Of course, the steering is unassisted, the brakes are unassisted, there's no ABS. It's just you, a manual gearbox, an engine, and the chassis. So even in wet conditions, and it's really wet at the minute, it's really honest, faithful, bloody fast. God, I love this car, this is such good fun. I'm freezing cold, soaking wet through. Oh, and I'm having a whale of a time. <laughs> How does anything compete with this? How does any car in the world launched this year compete with the reigning champion? Yeah, this is brilliant. Ah, oh, this is brilliant. This is the best driver's car we've got here for me. I've got one more car to try, which is a Lamborghini Huracan. We will drive. But from what I felt on the road yesterday and haven't driven it before, it's not as pure an experience as this, but we'll see. And then I'll have to see what everybody else thinks. But I think I know what I think. What a pure joy every second in one of those is. And so finally then to a Lamborghini Huracan rear wheel drive, which we've been told is a little bit loud by the marshals here. So I'm gonna go, I may not rip it out, but that's okay. It's pretty wet anyway, so I'm not sure I really want to rev it out to eight and a half. You sit quite high in it, really. It doesn't feel naturally low like the McLaren or even like the Ferrari. But the view out is terrific, that little letterbox view. Got big paddles. And the nice thing about this rear-wheel drive Huracan that you don't get with the all-wheel drive versions is the fact that the steering is completely uncorrupted because the front wheels are not doing any powering. They are just doing steering. So God, there's a really lovely flow to it, even in really wet conditions that you don't get in one where power is pushed to the front and it shuffles it around. Instead, it's quite a natural, easy balance. 
still does have that unbelievably spectacular engine if you want to use it. Adopts a nice easy angle out of a corner on a slide. I've got the ESC in sport mode. I've got the actual driving mode into sport rather than Corsa just because I think it'll probably pay not to have too much anger underfoot. But it's really enjoyable. It's not angry, it's just the steering quite quite light. It picks up a bit of weight as we build cornering forces. Sort of not loaded with feel in the same way that the McLaren is, but it is there is feel in that rack. And there's some grip at the front to lean on and then there's a bit of movement at the back if you ask a lot of it and you have to ask a lot of it because this engine is naturally aspirated so you want to be further up the rev range before you get big amounts of torque and power oh, it's really nice in that sort of faster corner through there and actually it's deceptively fast it's like 95 miles an hour through there it just sort of straightens the line on the way through it's a trustworthy agile rewarding car to drive even in these conditions, which I did not necessarily expect. I've come away impressed with this car. I like it a lot. And so to the final scores, we have five judges who each give up to 25 points for a car's performance on the road and 25 for the track for a maximum of 250. In reverse order then, the BMW M2, Aston Martin Vantage and Porsche Taycan finished kind of in a group together. Then came the Lamborghini Huracan and Porsche 911 Turbo, similarly close. The top three was tight. The GR Yaris does a sensational giant killing job, finishing just a few points away from a tie for first place, where the Aerial Atom and McLaren 765 had 219 points apiece. But because two judges placed the Atom first and only one placed the McLaren first, it's the Aerial that gets the nod. And the reason that this is the best car to drive of the year is the reason that although it's like 10 degrees drizzling and miserable and I shouldn't have worn an open visor helmet, I'm still having a brilliant, brilliant time in this car. Everything is just so linear and responsive. Steering is unassisted, the brakes are unassisted. There's no ABS, there is traction control. But basically what happens is down to the driver. If I put in that much steering, I get that much response. So if I put in that much steering, I get that much response. It's just a wonderfully involving, engaging process. On track, it is superb. It's so agile, so adjustable and responsive, and it feels like a sort of benchmark for everything else in a way that back in the day, Autocar used to bring a Caterham 7 to this event every year. And in the end, they just stopped saying, well, actually, we won't include it in the results because it's just going to win. Let it just be the benchmark by which other things are measured. And against the other cars here, that's kind of how the Atom 4 feels to me. It feels like the car the others are benchmarked against, but they will never compete with because this weighs so little. It has so little else going on other than the things that make it good to drive. You could argue the McLaren has the same, but they've decided to make a car that is good to drive above 120, 130 miles an hour. This is not like that. This is fun all the time, which is why it has nothing on it other than what you need. So even though the rain is firing into my eyeballs like pinpricks, and I am shivering, and although they say there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing, and they're totally lying, I'm having a great time in this car. This is just one of the greatest modern driving experiences you could possibly want. I absolutely adore the Aerial Atom 4, and it is quite rightly the winner of Autocars, Britain's best driver's car shootout of 2020. For more shootouts, sensible car reviews, so on and so forth, keep coming back to this channel. Maybe subscribe, would love an up thumb and a subscription. We do appreciate your support of the channel. We're also in all good news agents every Wednesday and at autocar.co.uk all the time and if you'll excuse me i'm going to go and find a warm radiator to go and sit next to just as soon as i've driven this car until it runs out of fuel